you know what? Let me pray. I, I got a real burden this morning. My burden is this. You know, often I pray that as I preach God's word that God will speak to his people. He'll do something in their hearts. They'll be transformed. Something will, when they leave, they'll never be the same. You know, that, that, my prayer is a little different this morning. My prayer is for Moraine Valley Church to be transformed, not just an individual. Now, obviously, individuals need to be transformed to be a part of that, but I'm praying that the mentality, you know, the Word of God renews our mind to transform. I'm praying that God will transform the mentality of Moraine Valley Church. I'm praying this morning that the mentality of the elder board, the deacon board, the staff, ministry heads, the people of Moraine Valley would be transformed by the Word of God. And I have zero capacity to pull that off. So would you pray with me? And let's ask God to do something here this morning that will change Moraine Valley Church forever. That's my hope and prayer. Father, that's my heart. You've heard it from me already in prayer last night and this morning, and now I'm coming corporately with my brothers and sisters. Lord, we're desperate for you to manifest your presence here today. God, we already know you're here. You tell us you're here. Lord, we need to be touched just by the hem of your garment this morning at Moraine Valley Church, God, so that we could be changed forever. So, Lord, I want to come to you. I thank you that your word is able to pierce as far as the division of the soul and the spirit, to judge the thoughts and the motivations of our hearts. Your word, Lord, is able to transform us at the core of our being, Lord, your word is able to build us up. It's able to teach us, to confront us, to correct us, to train us. Lord, the list goes on. But I pray especially in Jeremiah, where he said your word was like a fire and like a hammer which shatters a rock. This morning, God, would your Holy Spirit take the word like a sword in the hands of the Spirit of God. And God, would you... Just cut to the core of us as a church and us as people. God, would your word be like a fire that consumes the junk in our life that is not consistent with your word? And God, would it be like a hammer that breaks the strongholds and the mountains in our hearts and lives that stand in the way? So God, I come before you. I want to commit this morning to you. I want to trust that the Spirit of God will do what he does, Lord. And that's what I can't do. And that's to change us forever through your word. So God, I pray that would happen in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, whenever we go to a movie or read a book, there's always a, a main character, somebody who the story is built around. Then you have your supporting character. Uh, you know, sometimes there may be a couple, but you know, there's that person that's kind of like number two in the story that, that's, that's very important to it. But then we have what we call the cast of thousands. That's a, a bunch of nameless, unidentified people that are part of the story, but they're not the central part of the story. Now, when you go to the book of Acts, the main character in the book of Acts is the Holy Spirit of God. The supporting characters... The, the, the other ones that are real big in the story, that's the apostles and especially Peter and Paul come to the surface as the supporting characters in the book of Acts. But then there's the cast of thousands. <laughs> there's that cast of a whole bunch of people that we don't know their names. Uh, you know, they're unknown to us. But what we find out is they play a significant role in what God was doing in his church at that time. So this morning, that's what I want to focus upon. I want to focus upon the impact of those unknown, unnamed, hundreds and thousands of people who are part of the book of Acts. And then I want to take a look at how we have an impact today as basically the unknown, the unnamed people in the church today and what God wants to do through us. See, we relate more with that cast than we do with Peter and Paul and the apostles. 
We kind of relate with that other group, you know? And we're going to be encouraged to find out today that God uses people other than Billy Graham. And, and the big name people that we know, we can fill in the list with hundreds of other names. And we're kind of, it's a temptation for us to sit back and kind of think, God, you're going to use them and carry the ball through them. But we're going to find out through the book of Acts, the ball was carried in a gigantic way by these nameless, unknown hundreds and thousands of believers that really advanced the church in the early years. That's where we're going this morning. And simply, my first point is this, the cast, you know what the cast means now, this this cast of thousands, they cast the seed of God's word. Now, I'm not talking about a cast, but cast it, they scattered it. So the cast, cast the word. That's what their role was in the book of Acts. And to understand the significance of their impact, we got to remember the mission that Jesus gave to his followers. Remember, he was with them right before the ascension. So I'm, you're going to be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. And as we've gone through the book of Acts, we've learned this. I think I have it in a PowerPoint. The more that God's people prayerfully spread his word in the power of the Holy Spirit, the more lost people that get saved and the more believers are strengthened and grow. We learn that through the progress reports throughout the book. Craig gave us a whole message on that uh, back at the end of last year. So I started this series. We started to look at that again. That God's plan was is that as his word was scattered around by those who prayerfully in dependence on the Holy Spirit scattered it, God used that word to transfer sinners into the kingdom of his son and to transform believers into the image of his son. That was God's strategy in the early church, as we see in the book of Acts. And in chapters 1 to 8 was that Jerusalem part. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 5. I want you to see what took place. This first part of God's plan started right there in Jerusalem with the word of God being spread throughout the city. Acts chapter 5, verse 28. This is when the apostles were brought in before the council of Jewish leaders. Uh, They had been told earlier on, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. They kept on preaching in the name of Jesus. When you come to Acts chapter 5, 28, this is what they say. We gave you strict orders not to continue to teach in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. I love that. I'm challenged by that. My heart, my prayer, (laughs) the palest heights, southwest suburbs of Chicago will be filled with the teachings of Jesus. Matter of fact, maybe so much so that Gary and Jim, Joel and some of the others will be brought in and put in prayer. I'm not going to include myself in that, but I hope that it goes so well that, no, seriously, you know, they were persecuted for it, and they kept on going. Nothing would stop them. Nothing would sidetrack them from this. They filled the city with the teachings of Jesus. And then look at, we look at chapter 6, verse 7. And we see the result of what happened from that. At the end, it said, The word of God kept on spreading, and the number of disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. That's unbelievable. The priests were even coming to the faith. God's word filled Jerusalem. People got saved. Jews were saved. Their religious leaders were saved. They, the Spirit of God moved and put his hand on what was doing as they increased greatly. Then we learn in chapter 7 about Stephen, who was martyred. And at the end of that chapter, I want you to look at chapter 8 and see what happens. Verse 1. 
it says this, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So here we got the persecution is coming. Stephen was martyred. A great persecution breaks out against the believers in Jerusalem. And what we see is that the believers were scattered out beyond Jerusalem into the second phase of what God said, that that they'd be witnesses not only in Jerusalem, but also in all of Judea and Samaria. And so now we have the, the believers, this cast, these unnamed, unknown people are spread throughout all of Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. They were still in Jerusalem. And then it says this down in verse 4. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. How did the word get beyond Jerusalem? How did it start to go out into Judea and Samaria? Guess what? It wasn't by the apostles. It was by those people who we don't know their names. We, we, we know nothing about them other than it was a bunch of believers that got scattered throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria and they began to take God's word. I want you to look at another passage with this unnamed group of people who we don't know. It's in Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Matter of fact, I'll put up that map, thank you. Whoa, I don't think you guys will be able to see that map. I can barely see it. But at the top of the Dead Sea is Jerusalem. And then if you look, the area around there is Judea and Samaria. Jerusalem's a city. Judea and Samaria were the areas, the districts they were in. And so it all started in the city with the apostles, but as it moved out into the districts around there, the word of God was scattered by those who were the believers. And then we come to chapter 11, verse 19. And Craig, this is exciting. I'm going to preach on the church of Antioch next week. It's interesting. Antioch was the first missionary church that really began to intentionally thrust the word of God out in regions beyond. Uh, Just the church, as we're going to learn from Craig next week, is just so significant to what God was doing at that time. That church was started by a bunch of people. We don't even know what their names are or who they are. Because look at what he says down here in verse 19. So then... Those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. Then in verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. And then as you read on there, Jerusalem heard about it. The believers back and the apostles, they said, we've got to send Barnabas up there to help all these new believers that are coming to Christ in this new area. And then Barnabas said, I've got to go get Paul. And so Paul and Barnabas came back and began to teach in that church to build and strengthen these new believers in Christ. But again, this significant church in the history of what God was doing was started because a bunch of people who we don't know their names, you know, they don't have their names in print or reserved in a way that that gives them some special honor, but through them, the word of God was spread. And as God's word was spread, more of the lost people were saved. And as God's word was spread through Barnabas and Paul, uh, Saul, that, 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 that more and more of the believers were strengthened. A map shows that again. Here it was, started in Jerusalem, went out to Samaria, Judea around there. Then they started to move up north to Phoenicia. All the way, they went up to that island, uh, island of Cyprus and then up to Antioch, which was in Syria. And then it also says, and they were speaking just to the Jews as they were scattering the word. But there were some men from Cyrene that's over on the northern part of Africa, near where Libya would be today. 
and others from Cyprus that joined together, and they went to Antioch and started to spread the word of God to those who were Greeks. And so here we go again. God's movement of his church is happening not through the big names that we all know, but through a bunch of unnamed, unknown people. I want you to see one more passage in Acts 19. And then I'm going to say, what, what does this mean for you and me? Acts 19, I, this is one of my favorite passages in the book of Acts. Verses 8, 9, and 10. This takes place in Ephesus. And so listen as I start here. Es Ephesus is on the Asian continent there. And so uh, it says this. In verse 8, speaking of Paul, he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, Paul withdrew from them and he took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. This took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. Where did the word of God go this time? You tell me. Where? All over Asia, didn't it? Let me ask you, where was Paul? Look back at the text. Where was Paul during this time? I, sorry, couldn't hear you. He was still in Ephesus, wasn't he? Every day, teaching in the school, the believers. So let me ask you, if Paul is in a room, in a school, in Ephesus, every day reasoning with the believers who've come to Christ, strengthening and teaching them with God's word, and if God's word spread throughout all of Asia, <laughs> who did it? Wasn't Paul, was it? This is what the scripture says. You know, the apostles, the, the pastors, the teachers are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And if you look at those who are equippers, they're all ministers of the word. And they're to bring God's word to equip the saints so that the saints do the work of the ministry. And when the saints do the work of the ministry, the body is built up and grows. And so here we have a beautiful picture of it in Ephesus. As Paul is there with the believers, and he's focusing on building and strengthening them with the Word of God. And as they're being equipped with the Word of God, they're going throughout all of Asia as they go back to their homes and they go back to their workplaces and they go on their vacations, whatever they do over those two years. And the Word of God is spreading throughout the entire continent of Asia. You starting to see the role that the church played? We start off when we see this, and keep that up, Pete, because we're going to come to that. I want... I want I want to say that, but God used these unknown, nameless believers to cause God's word to go beyond Jerusalem into all of Judea and Samaria. And they even started the church of Antioch because of that, as a result of that, one of the most important churches in the whole book of Acts. But then when they went to Asia, and it was spread throughout all of Asia, the church of, uh, of Colossae, you know, the book of Colossians, was started because of a number of people, we don't even know their names, they were being trained and equipped with the word of God by Paul, and they were going out, and they were bringing the word, and Colossae was one of the cities, churches that started. Matter of fact, all seven of the churches of the book of Revelation are believed to be started at this time as the word of God was going on throughout all of Asia and we read about the seven churches of Revelation those were all churches in Asia so God used these people that nobody knows their names but who were believers to form his church in a gigantic way as they took God's word and spread it around See, God had a significant role for these people who we don't even know their names, unknown to us, they had a significant role in the formation of the church. 
And God still has a significant role for those people whose names we don't know and probably never will know to help continue to spread and grow his church. You see, we are God's cast, casting the seed of God's word. Just as they were the cast, casting the seed, guess what our role is today? We're God's cast today in the world, us who probably nobody in the rest of the world is going to know our names as far as it comes with Christian history. But we, as well as other believers around the world that we don't know their names, are a gigantic piece of God's plan today to continue to spread his word, to grow his church, and see people grow. I basically, I say this. We saw it before. The more God's people prayerfully spread his word and the power of the Holy Spirit, the more lost they get saved and the more believers that are strengthened and grow. Still true today. It's the principle we learned in the book of Acts, but it's still the way God works today. And the more that God's word is scattered, in dependence upon the Holy Spirit to work through his word as people prayerfully pray that God will move through the ministry of his word, the more lost people that are transferred into the kingdom of his son and the more believers that are transformed into the image of his son. It's still God's plan today. And we are a significant part of God's plan. Listen to what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Leave that up there a second, Pete, before you put up the next one. Simply, this is what he's saying. God did the work through Christ of reconciliation. But look at what God did. The work was done by Jesus, and God has committed to us the word of reconciliation. He did the work. We spread the word. We are the ones that God has entrusted to, has given the responsibility to, to take this word of reconciliation to the world around us. Therefore, as the next verse says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Guys, we are ambassadors. You have got one of, I'm going to tell you what, I'm not even going to say one, you've got the most significant role in the world. It's more significant than being the President of the United States. That's the political world. It's important, and it's a big piece of what's happening. But the kingdom of God and what God's doing through his church. I love what Jeremiah says. He says, you know, pollution has gone out into all the land from my prophets. See, we like to blame the politicians for all the problems. God's putting his finger on the prophets and saying, you know what? These guys have distorted my message. They're not proclaiming my message. They're not saying it right. They're giving their own words and their own ideas and their own dreams profiting my people nothing but brothers and sisters we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ you and me are his official representatives here in a foreign land this world is not my home I'm just a passing through I'm an ambassador for Jesus you're an ambassador for Jesus we're all looking for significance guys we're not gonna find any more significance than that we are official representatives for the King of Kings. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And then he said this, here's the message we bring. Guys, this is, I love this verse here. He made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus. He made him, the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf. Jesus bore our sins. Why? So that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The greatest exchange of all time. The greatest trade of all time, you could call it. Those of us follow sports and, and love to see the trades. Jesus got our sin we got his rights. Now, who got the deal in that trade? I always like to say, who, who got the better deal in the trade? We, the cross, there was an exchange, there was a trade. 
Jesus got our sin, we get his righteousness. So we're his ambassadors, bringing that message to the world around us. God has committed to you and me that word. So, you know, I did a lot of things. I'm saying to myself, okay, God, so what is the gospel? You tell us in Galatians that if even an angel shows up on Sunday morning and he gives a message that's different than the message that Paul gave, he says, let him be accursed. So the gospel is important to be pure and understood. And so I said to myself, what is the gospel? What is this message I'm entrusted to? I want to be a faithful ambassador. I want to speak what my king tells me to represent of him as I speak his word into this foreign nation. You following me? So I had to ask myself. And so there's two places that Paul reveals the gospel that he spoke. First one's 1 Corinthians 15. You don't have to turn to it. I'll just tell you that Paul said, this is the gospel which I preach to you. This is the one by which you were saved. This is the one you still stand in. It's simply this, that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. And then it says this, he goes on to talk about all the people that saw him, and then he said this, whether I preached it or they, so you believed. So this is the first place in Scripture we see Paul saying, okay, we keep, Paul gives say, this is important, this is important. Well, Paul, would you preach then? That this is the message he preached about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. And then you come to Romans chapter 1. This verse I want to show you. Paul says this, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it, the antecedent of it, for you, the gram- gram- I can't even say the word, those that know grammar well, <laughs> is the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. You know what he's saying there? The DNA is right in the gospel. The power to transform a life, to transfer a sinner out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son is built right into the gospel. The gospel has the power right in the heart of it to take a life and transform it and change it. You see, that's where God's power is, is in the gospel. And then I like what the next verse says, for in it, what is it? The gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So what's revealed in the gospel? The righteousness of God. You follow me? From faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. There's What we've seen so far in Paul's gospel is that the objective truth is this. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And that what's revealed in this gospel is the very righteousness of God. Now the subject of response to this gospel is faith. We saw that in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, it doesn't matter who preached it, you believed it. Then you come here and he says in uh, Romans chapter 1, he says, it's revealed from faith to faith. It's for everyone who believes. So the objective gospel is really a combination of the cross, burial and resurrection of Christ with the righteousness of God and man's subjective response, the way they plug into that is by faith. And so as we wrestle with this, we actually had a Jerusalem council of our own, which you hear in a few weeks at our board level. So what is the gospel? We're here as a, it was one of those that were there, no, it was one of the most awesome nights we had as a board as we wrestled through, what is the gospel? The gospel is not asking Jesus into your heart. And so many people have placed their faith that one day in the past they said a prayer and asked Jesus into their heart. Is that the gospel? Is that what Paul said the gospel was? How about committing your life to Jesus? This morning, stand up and come forward and commit your life to Jesus. Is that the gospel? Me doing something for God? Isn't the gospel about God doing something for me through Jesus? And brothers and sisters, the modern church today is filled with gospels that smell like the real thing but confuse people. Just say this prayer got to be honest with you guys. I've prayed a lot of faithless prayers. 
I'm, I'm not happy about that. I'm not proud to admit it, but you know, think about yourself. How many prayers have you prayed? You're just kind of going through the routine, saying your prayers. Did you really believe God was going to do it? See, everybody calls the name of the Lord to be saved, but it says in that passage, he who believes will call on the Lord. It's got to be a prayer that springs from faith. And so we wrestled and said, what is the gospel? And if we're going to equip our people at Moraine Valley Church with the gospel so that they can take it out to people, we've got to be real clear on what the gospel is. So elders, yes, thank you. Elders, you've got a packet I want you to pass out to the people now. We developed a threefold approach because we wanted to equip you with the tools of the gospel. And it's going to be put in your hand right now, and uh, I'll refer to it here in a second. But we want to put in your hand some tools this morning that are built on, really, the combination of God's righteousness and the cross, burial, and resurrection of Jesus as the gospel. And man's response to it is faith. And so we looked at a lot of tools, and there are good tools out there, and this is not the only, we're not saying this is finally the right one, that's not what I'm saying, but this is one we said we can own, and it really captures our heart as we seek to communicate the gospel. What you're going to find in this as you receive it, as you open it up, the first thing you'll find is a little card uh, that is a three open, it says three open prayer. Remember when Ron Hutchcraft was here, Ron taught us how to pray that prayer. He takes the Word of God in three different portions that are all prayers, that talks about God opening up a door, an opportunity for me to share the gospel. The second one is to open my mouth and put the words in it. The third one is the prayer about opening the hearts of the people and responding like we saw in the book of Acts with Lydia. And so to start to pray, and this is for you, keeping your Bible, keeping your wallet, whatever is a reminder to pray the three open prayer. I've got to tell you something. I, I was taking three guys through some material with this stuff that I'm presenting to you today, and I was trying to train them and help them understand the theology behind it and how to use these tools. And I was praying, God, open a door. I don't want to just talk to these guys and, you know, not... not, not beyond the playing field. I've had a lot of opportunities to pass, but I want something fresh and current. I'm saying, God, open a door. Well, I went through this five-week session with these guys, praying that every day, no door opened. I was discouraged. Matter of fact, I said, you know, this doesn't work. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to quit. But the Spirit of God said, Pat, persist in prayer. He wouldn't let me quit. I continued to pray that prayer And God did something amazing. Within a six-week period, I had an opportunity to lead five people to Christ. It was amazing to me because that's not, that's Gary Olson's normal life. That's not my normal life. And so for me, it was exciting. Some of you say, well, that was Easter. You invited people to come up and talk to you. Only one of those came from Easter. The other four came through circumstances totally unrelated to that in a whole different way. And so as I continued to persist in this, God did open the door. And God did give me the words. And God did give them a heart to pay close attention and to respond to what I had to say. So I want to encourage you, begin to pray this prayer that God will open a door for you to share the gospel. And then that he would open up your mouth and give you the words. Now the second thing is what we call a seed card. It's got the greatest trade of all time took place at the cross. This is a seed card. You know why we call it a seed card? Because God's word is a seed. We had a discussion at the board. It, we got a QR code on the back. Is the whole purpose of this to get people to go to our webpage and read more about the gospel? No, that is not the purpose. The purpose of this is because we got God's word right here on the card. Is for that word to penetrate their heart. Because we believe that the DNA for a person to be saved is right in the gospel. And so we put right here on the front page of the seed card uh, the very verse we looked at just a few minutes ago. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And, and, and it shares with people what we just looked at about the great trade. He got our 
sin, we got his righteousness. Then you turn it over on the back, and then it talks about, but to the one who does not work, rely on his own efforts, but believes in him who justifies and guides his faith is greater. So here's the response of faith to that. We ask a question under each one. Just the desire to try to get people to think about God's word. We're putting the seed in their hand. You know, man plants, another one waters, but God is the one that causes the growth. And so we, we made this seed card. This is the kind of thing you use when you go to a restaurant. A lot of Christians like to leave a dollar tip in a track. I gotta encourage you, leave a 25% tip in a track, otherwise don't leave a track. You know, you just can't do that, guys. I remember being with a Christian once, I was shocked. They took him and I out to dinner, this when I was back in seminary. $100 bill, they, they left a $5 tip. I wanted to crawl out of that place and pretend like I wasn't with them. I, I was so embarrassed. I was so poor I couldn't add any more to it, but uh, <laughs> I was embarrassed and so I slipped out. But You know, guys, this is the kind of thing when you, you say, hey, I want, I want to plant a seed here. You know, it might be at one of our elders at Dunkin' Donuts. There was a guy who uh, obviously didn't have money to buy a meal, so he bought a meal for this guy. Or, or did I say Dunkin' Donuts, meant McDonald's. He bought a meal for this guy, and the guy said, why are you doing this? He was part of the team of guys who was helping develop this, and he ran out to his car, got one of these little seed cars, came back, said, this is why I'm doing it. Read this when you get a chance. See, that's, this is a seed card. We're believing that God is going to work through his word to bring people to Christ. We want the city of Palos, we want the southwest suburbs of Chicago to be filled with the teachings of Jesus. The other thing you have in there is a track. This is the kind that you would use in a whole different way. Uh, actually, Craig Perrell, who was sitting here and moved, uh, he and I kind of developed the content of this track. I had worked one up many years ago. Craig took it and kind of reviewed it and a couple suggested changes. This has been through the elders, through so many people looking at it. And what this is, is a approach that once again says we believe that it's God who converts people. It isn't me outsmarting them. It isn't not me having all the right answers, but it's God working through his word. So this track allows us, and I uh, encourage you to look at this here when you go home, takes people through the gospel again. And I just want to take you through the pictures. Tammy Brassfield, thank you. You didn't want that public acknowledgement, but we kind of had this idea about the gospel. We said, Tammy, can you put it in images for us? And so Tammy really, I'll tell you what, this is my vote for a new wordless book when you see these images because it communicates the gospel. Just look at the pictures. It'll give you the heart of this track. The first uh, reality is that man's relationship with God is broken. She used the whole concept of pottery, and here we got this perfect pottery. God is on it, shining glory and righteousness and fullness of God there. And here's man who's broken. Everybody falls short. Everybody's relationship with God is broken. Well, the next point we say is this, you can never be good enough to get right with God. This, this approach, by the way, is not designed to convince people how bad of sinners they are. Because you know what? You can be good and be a sinner. <laughs> you see, our desire is, is let, let's reach the highest righteous person, help them see that they're not as good as Jesus. That'll catch everybody else. And so our desire is to say, I don't care how good you are, you're never good enough. You'll never be as good as Jesus. And so this picture here is the picture of a pot that's been kind of bandaged up and glued up and tried to get better, but it's still not as good as God. The third point is God provides his righteousness to us through Jesus. You see, I can never be good enough for God, but you know what? God is a gift, gives his right. Remember what's revealed in the gospel? It's the righteousness of God, isn't it? So God gives as a gift the righteousness of Christ to us. And so what we have here on this next pot is the fact of that, that name that had God always. Now Jesus' name is there because in John we know that if you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Man's still broken. Jesus is the righteous one. Then the picture of 2 Corinthians 5, 21, at the cross, the great trade took place where all of a sudden man received God's righteousness and Jesus took on man's brokenness and sin. And then I love the last point, you know, as we talk about faith, 
Then on the last page, you've got this picture of man and Jesus filled with the righteousness of God on the basis of faith. That's the heart of where this track goes. It combines the cross of Christ, the righteousness of God, and man's response by faith. I'm excited about this. How do you use this one? Two ways. There's the one you sit down and say, hey, I want to have a cup of coffee with you and talk to you about the thing that's been the most important thing in my life. And so you are able to sit down and say, can we walk through this together? There's also the kind, though, you can give to somebody and say, would you go home and read this and I want to talk to you about it maybe next week. We design it in a way that a person can go through it themselves as we walk them through, as it, the, the questions walk them through and the verses to look at. One last thing we provided is this. A book by Andy Stanley called this. Since nobody's perfect, how good is good enough? The same track, same thing we're going. And what Andy Stanley does in this book is this. The first three quarters of the book, he writes it in a way that talks from a philosophical point of view, convincing man that you can never be good enough for God. He does a, doesn't even bring in the scripture, totally philosophical. But then in the last quarter of the book, he brings in the gospel of Jesus Christ and how God's righteousness is provided through us through Christ. Maybe we can never be good enough, but God gives it to us through Jesus, through what he did at the cross. And we're so excited to find a book that has the same thrust, the same movement. And so we got a seed track we can put in people's hands that has the same message. We have a track that has the same message. We've got a book that has the same message. Everyone can be used in a different way. And this book can be used in the sense of either to break the ground and say, hey, you know what, I want you to read this book. This is what's meant a lot in my life, and I didn't, you don't know where to start with them. So you say, read this book and let's talk about it. Or maybe you talk to somebody, they're still not getting it, and say, hey, let me follow up with this. This takes about 90, I'm a slow reader, and it took me about 90 minutes to read. It's a simple book, but wow, it's powerful. Everybody I've shared this with, and some of the elders, when I shared it with them, have already read it, have already mailed this off to friends because they said, wow, this is unbelievable. I'm going to send this to my brother. I've got to send this to my friends that's taking a trip so they can read it on the plane. You know, it's really an exciting book, and I hope you'll take a look at it. So... Um, after the service, and I'm really getting close to wrapping up, probably been long today, but sorry. <laughs> this book is available. We stepped out by faith. I'm going to be honest with you. We, we, we're so excited. We purchased 1,500 of these books. Um, it's not one of those we've got 10 books back there. We're trusting God that his people are going to help God's word get scattered. We got business cards back there for you, seed card, they're business card size. Seed cards that you can take in that little Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's tip setting like that. We've got tracks for when you want to sit down with somebody and say, hey, would you really read this? I want you to look at it. Those are all available to you on two tables in the back you'll see this morning. Now, the only one we're asking you to pay for if you can afford it is the book. It's $2. Um... You know what, actually, if you went to Amazon, you'd pay a lot more for it. We were able to get it bulk. We got a deal. We talked to them and everything. But I did something I normally don't do without even telling the deacons. If you're a deacon here this morning, it's the first time you're hearing about this. Okay, I just went out and spent a bunch of money and didn't ask you or tell you until the service. They do say forgiveness is a lot easier than permission. So... Uh, I would ask you if you could throw in a couple dollars or maybe this. Maybe you're a person that says, man... I've just been waiting for a time to invest in something like this. We had to have these things printed up. We got these books. Total cost for the books and all the material we print up was $2,600. The cafe has given $500 to offset the cost uh, from, from their funds. And maybe you say, hey, you know what? I, I, I'm going to write a check for $2,100, or maybe I got a couple hundred buck dollars we put towards it so Pat doesn't get in trouble with the deacons. No, I'm kidding you. <laughs> if you feel led to God. Say, but, you know, we just stepped out and said, God, we can't sit back and wait. Keith was out of town. We, we just can't wait. We've got to move forward. This is too important. And so if you pick up a book, if you could help us out a little bit with that, that would be awesome. So this is where we're going from here. This is what God's put in my heart. Pete, you can put up the slide. 
I'm trusting God for 35 people that I can personally train with the tools and the theology of the gospel. The theology that goes behind, there's a lot of theology behind evangelism, what God does, what man does, how he does it, the power of the word, things like this. And so my initial thought was I'm going to have a class on Saturday morning. I'm going to invite 35 men and women there. I'm going to train them all and send them out. And I thought, God, you know what? It's not the way to do it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite people in groups of three or four, and I'm going to spend four or five weeks with them, and I'm going to intensely train them in the tools and the theology of the gospel. I'm trusting God I'll have 35 people for that by May of next year. But through them, my hope is, is that 200 people at Moraine Valley Church by the end of next year will be trained in the theology and the tools of how to share the gospel. Again, not in a classroom setting after class where there's 40 or 50 people, in a small group setting where there's three or four people where you're interacting and really talking and wrestling and getting through this. So this is where I'm going with this. This is important. This is why we're here. It's part, you know, when we come together, the church is to be built up and to edify. In many ways, this is like half time for the believers come in from a week out in the weary world, and I need to be strengthened and renewed to go back out to where our ministries, where now you become the pastors of the people in your families and your neighbors and your workplaces and schools and play places. And so my job is to equip you with the tools so that you can do the ministry. My prayer, oh, wouldn't it be awesome? if the southwest side was filled with the teachings of Jesus because of Moraine Valley Church. Because God's people said, God, I'm an ambassador. That's what I'm here for. And so I have a sign-up sheet in the back, and i got to encourage you to be patient. The trainers I'm handpicking, if you want to be trained, you know, you say, I want to be one of those 200 people. And if you, want to, if you want to be a trainer, come to me personally and let me know. I'd be glad to work with you, male or female. We'll meet in small group settings. But be patient, because obviously this goal is going to take some time. I didn't want to throw a program to quickly move. I want to do like Jesus did. He worked with people, develop them, and let it grow. And so we're hoping that this will grow as we become a church that begins to say, God, you know what? We're not just about coming here to church on Sunday and getting fed and getting bigger and stronger. But God, we're a people who come to church to be fed and to be strengthened and renewed so we can go back out and do our ministry. Because when the church is gathered, it's to be edified. When it's scattered, it's to evangelize. And brothers and sisters, it's time. It's time for Moraine Valley. We have been a one-dimensional church for the most part. That's the reality. I'll take responsibility as a senior pastor. My burden and passions are to help believers be transformed to the image of his son. But God has spoken to me, Pat, part of your work is to transfer sinners into the kingdom of his son. And so my prayer starting today is that Moraine Valley is going to have a new DNA. We're not just going to be about people who come to get stronger in Jesus. But we're going to become people who come to get stronger in Jesus so we can go back out and spread his word around where he takes us because, as it says here, put up that next slide, Pete, the more God's people at Moraine Valley Church prayerfully spread his word and the power of the Holy Spirit, the more lost people that will get saved in the southwest side of Chicago and the more believers will be strengthened and grow. It's just the truth. Guys, you can see we got plenty of seats to put them in. That's what God's called us to do. God's laid the principle. Bill, you, I wish you would have wore your shirt today. I would have had you stand up again. Poor Bill came to a meeting yesterday. Bill, stand up. He's like, oh, man. His shirt said this, plant it and it will grow. Plant it and it will grow. Brothers and sisters, God's telling Moraine Valley Church this morning, if we plant God's word, in the community around us, it will grow. We plant, we water, God causes the growth. But brothers and sisters, if we do not spread his word to the world around us, we can't expect to see people come to Christ. And you know what my desire is for these empty chairs at Moraine Valley Church? It's this. Not that we get more Christians from other churches say, I like Moraine better than this church. 
Because that's what the church is great at today. We love to transfer, go to bigger, better whatevers and try to find whatever. You know what my hope is? That every one of these chairs that's still empty is filled with somebody that doesn't know Jesus. Who's come to Christ through one of the believers here at Moraine. And then we got a new problem. How do we train all these people? How, you know what? We may, have to, we may have so many people, we may have to get another staff member and say, you're totally focused. Or take one of our staff members and say, you're totally focused on building new believers and helping them grow in Christ. Guys, this is my heart. This is my hope. I, I'm making a public confession. I don't think I've led us well here. But with the time I have left, I feel God's called me to change that. And it's starting by taking a few and training them who are going to take some others and putting the tools in your hands so that Moraine Valley Church can fill the southwest side of Chicago with the teachings of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, grab some seeds on the way out. Grab some tracks. These books are awesome. You're going to want to get one. You probably want to get five, to be honest with you. I'm serious. You know, some of you are saying, man, this is unbelievable. I, the first time I ever read right away, I thought, and this, I'm going to be a mini Mike this morning. Mike, where are you at, brother? If I had the glasses and the hair, I could be just like you. But I'm going to bring a challenge to you. It's like Mike did last week. I encourage you to pick up a book. Hope you pick up two, maybe three. And that by the end of this week, with a personal note, you send this book to somebody. I love what one brother did. He has some friends that he'd been witnessing to for quite a while. When he read this book, he was so excited about it. They're good people, religious people, but they don't know Jesus. You do know that hell is lined with good, moral, religious people, don't you? You know, it's about faith. It's not about how good we are. And so this particular couple, one of them is struggling with cancer. And they're going on a trip, and he's going to send one to the wife and one to the husband and say, I want you to read this on the plane. We can talk about it when we get back. No, guys, there's, you're, you'll be excited. This is a great tool. We've put tools in your hands this morning for you. I encourage you to pick them up. Guys, might you, like me, come before God and say, God, you know what? I haven't done this too well up to this point, but God, it's got to change. May God change, that's why I'm praying today, may God change the DNA of Moraine Valley Church, not just the individuals, but we become a group of people who say, I'm not just coming to church to get fed more. I'm coming to church to be strengthened and fed so I can take what I have out to the world around me to bring Jesus and take what I have to other believers to help them be conformed more into the image of his son. Worship team, come on up. I'll close us in prayer. Father, Lord, that's my heart. It's your word. Lord, we're committing ourselves to you and just confessing before you, Lord, I confess as a leader, I have not led us well in this because of my own burdens and passions to the neglect of your mission. And Lord, I just pray that you would do something in me and in this church, God, that changes us forever. God, I pray that we would be evangelists all over the southwest side of Chicago. God, I pray that because of Moraine Valley Church, it would be accused that the teachings of Jesus are filling the city. God, I love what we read earlier. It's because you put your hand on them when they scattered that they succeeded. God, we need your hand. It's not about how wise and how we can outsmart them and how we can out cool them or whatever lord it's about your word in the hands of the spirit and the hearts of people transforming them and transferring them god i just ask would you be so gracious to make your face shine upon this place would you put your hand Lord, that as we move forward with your word to wherever you lead us to take it, Lord, would you grant it success? Might it grow? Might it spread? And God, might it result someday in people standing before Jesus giving you glory at your return because of what started today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.